give me faith. What an incredible prayer. What an appropriate prayer for times such as these. We're living through difficult times. The truth is we, as followers of Christ, have always lived through difficult times. It's just that our difficult times seem the most difficult because they're our difficult times. But they indeed are difficult times. If you have your Bibles, find your way to Revelation chapter 11. And I hope that today's word from the Lord will give you some encouragement. You know, last night I got to do something I haven't done in a long time. It felt, in fact, it felt very strange. Uh, last night, I actually walked into a movie theater and sat down and watched a movie in a theater. <laughs> it was a very strange thing. Uh, Jackson, my 13-year-old son, and I went and watched the new Spider-Man movie. And so we went and watched it together, and it, it's, a, it's a good movie. Um, it was, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'll give you just a few spoilers, but, but not many. If you haven't seen the movie by now, it's been out for a couple of months, so that's kind of on you, not on me. But if you don't want spoilers, then just plug your ears. About 20 minutes into the movie, there's a battle between Spider-Man and a supervillain. So you got a supervillain and Spider-Man, and they're fighting one another. And about 20 minutes into the movies when this battle occurs, and here's what happens in the battle. They battle back and forth, and, you know, it's a struggle back and forth, and Spider-Man can't quite get one over on him, but then it comes down to the point where it looks like the supervillain is just about to take Spider-Man out. And, in fact, you think, oh, he, he got him. The, the supervillain has won, and then at the last minute, Spider-Man finds a way to beat this supervillain, and he actually captures him. The supervillain doesn't get away. I mean, he captures him. It felt like the end of a superhero movie, but it was only 20 minutes into the movie. Now, everyone in that theater knew the movie was not yet over. It wasn't because what we saw on the screen. It was because we knew we were only 20 minutes into the movie. There must be more to come. We didn't pay money to come sit in these seats and watch a 20-minute movie. There is more to this movie, and indeed there was. Well, we're coming to a chapter, Revelation chapter 11, that's going to feel like the end of the book. In fact, as we read it, you're going to say, yeah, you know, it, it seems like everything's being sewn up here. But as we read it, we know it's not the end of the book. How do we know it's not the end of the book? Because there are 11 more chapters to come. So we still have much more to unpack in the book of Revelation. But what John does for us here, what the book of Revelation does for us in this chapter, is it gives us an opportunity to pull our head up and just for a moment get a glimpse of what it will be when all is said and done. In many ways, this is something of a halfway point in Revelation. From this point forward, we're going to continue to learn about the evil kingdoms of the world. We're going to continue to learn about the persecution that is coming against all followers of Jesus of all time. We're going to continue to learn about the victory uh, that God's kingdom will win, and we will continue to see the beauty and supremacy of Christ. And the imagery and symbolism from this point forward will get more intense, more vivid, more powerful. But in this point, we raise our heads, if you will, just a moment, and we get to see a glimpse of the end. We look forward to the final judgment and the reign of Christ in summary form. So Revelation chapter 11, beginning in verse 15. The Bible says this, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. Now stop right there for just a moment so I can point out what I mean. There were seven angels, right? Seven angels given seven trumpets. So as we're reading along in Revelation, had we never read the book before, we would assume that by the time we get to the seventh trumpet, this is it. In fact, what did Paul tell us? That it is at the final trumpet sound when Jesus will return. So if we're reading this and we don't know that there's a chapter 12, we'd say, okay, it's the seventh trumpet. This, is, this thing is all coming to a close. And then the Bible says, continuing in verse 15, there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Again, that's a statement of finality. It's done. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of God, our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Seems like a statement of finality. Verse 16, the 24 elders who sat on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. Now take a pause right there. We expected to say who is and who was and who is to come. But in this passage, as we see the, the coming of Christ being completed, then we recognize that the book of Revelation is giving us that statement intentionally. Who is 
who was, he is not to come anymore because in this passage, he has already come. He is here. So he is and he was. And then it tells us exactly uh, in detail, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. So it's done, right? The nations raged, verse 18, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was open and the ark of the covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. Do you feel it there? It's the end. Everything is sewn up. So why would John give us this? Why would the book of Revelation give us this? In part, the book of Revelation gives us this because we need to lift our heads up a little bit. We've got 11 chapters left to go. We need to lift our heads up a little bit because we need a little bit of hope. It's not just the book of Revelation that we're reading that's a difficult book to read that we need a little hope. It's the year 2022, in fact, for Christians of all times and all ages and all places, there comes time when we need a little bit of hope. And so the book of Revelation gives us this time to see through to the end of what that day will be like. No matter how bad this day is, we can look forward to that day. In fact, it is our hope. The Christian hope is this. There is coming a day when the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of God and of Christ. What a day that will be. Today, First Baptist Tillman's Corner, whether you're here with us in person or you're watching online, I want to invite you to celebrate and think about that day. You know, trumpets were used in the Old Testament for many things. They were used to get people's attention, basically, but they might get people's attention for one of many different things. They might uh, get their attention to make an important announcement. They might get their attention to warn of an oncoming battle, but there's one place in particular in the Old Testament that I, that I want to point you to. I just jot this down in your notes if you're taking notes. 1 Kings chapter 1. If you look in 1 Kings chapter 1, you see a trumpet used for a specific moment. And, and I think it's so, in light of Revelation chapter 11, I think it's so interesting to think about 1 Kings chapter 1. In 1 Kings chapter 1, David is in his final days on earth, and he's establishing the king who will come after him. That is to be Solomon. It, we know that. Solomon followed David. But in that time, it wasn't settled. David had settled it, but the nation had not settled it. And David had another son called, <clears throat> named Adan. Ad let me back up and try one more time. Ad Adonijah, thank you for uh, some help coming over here from the left. Adonijah, and thank you for Bible trivia winner, whoever said that. <clears throat> Adonijah, who, who determined he was going to take the throne. So he says, I'm, I'm going to take the throne from Solomon. And he comes up with a conspiracy, if you will. Before David dies, because the right time for the king to come to the throne is after the king is dead. So before David dies, I'm going to establish myself as king before Solomon has the opportunity. So Adonijah gets a group of people together, his supporters, and he's basically going to have a political rally and announce himself as king. David gets wind of this, and he says, before he can do that, let's establish Solomon as king. So I want you to know that these two things are taking place within earshot of one another. So David says, gather everybody together, get Solomon. I'm going to go to the ceremony so that all the people can see that I have chosen Solomon as my successor, and we're going to set him up as king today. So Adonijah, the, the rebel, the one who's going against the will of the king, who's trying to steal the kingdom, he's having his political party over here. And just across town, Solomon is being set up as king. So as Solomon is set up as king, they blow a trumpet and they announce Solomon as king. Well, over here at Adonijah's inauguration political party gathering, they hear a trumpet. And they say, what was that trumpet? And they say, we don't know. Well, somebody needs to find out. So word gets back to Adonijah. That trumpet was David establishing Solomon as king. Do you see what's happening here? The fake king has just realized that the real king has come and a trumpet has sounded. And then Adonijah uses a Hebrew word. Uh-oh, <laughs> it's not good. The Bible says that all of his supporters fled 
he ran to the tabernacle and grabbed the horns of the altar and begged for mercy not to be killed because he knew now that the rightful king had come to the throne and he no longer had an opportunity to run his little miniature revolution and steal the kingdom. When I read 1 Kings chapter 1, and I read Revelation 11, and I see that seventh trumpet blown, and I see the real king come to earth, and I see the fake king and all the fake kingdoms subdued, and I see them scatter. I think, my God, what a day that will be when you come. When you come and rule and reign, and all the pretend kings flee and run. The Christian hope is this. There is coming a day when the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of God and of Christ. That day has been promised to us over and over again in the Hebrew Scriptures. We're told that the Messiah will reign forever and ever. And here we just read about it in Revelation chapter 11. He shall reign forever and ever. We've been praying for that day. The Lord taught us to pray, didn't he? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have been looking for this day. We've been promised this day. We've been praying for this day. We've been waiting for this day. So what happens when this day comes? This passage tells us what happens when this day comes. When the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of God, here's what happens. First, God's people will worship him. God's people will worship him. So the Bible says there in verse 16 that when heaven announces this, that the elders, the 24 elders, and remember they represent the old covenant people of God and the new covenant people of God, when they hear this, they bow down before God and they worship him. They fall on their faces and worship God. So what is the posture of their worship? The posture of their worship is that they fall on their face. That's why, by the way, sometimes it's important to come to an altar and kneel down before the Lord. You say, well, I don't have to do all that. God can do all that work in my heart, right? Hey, he can. He can do all that work in your heart. In fact, God's work is really in your heart. But when God does a work in your heart, it flows out to physical uh, symbols in your body. So yes, you can bow your heart without bowing your knee, but there comes a time when you just need to say, I don't really care. I need to get on my knees before God, and it doesn't matter to me who is watching. The posture of their worship. We have something of a posture of worship discussion going on in our church family right now. We have the whole chairs and pews thing, right? Uh, So we put chairs in the middle, and we've got a chairs on the outside, a pews in the middle. All the pews are coming back. It just takes some time for us to get them in one at a time because we're spacing them differently. But do you know, do you know that, yes, in our First Baptist Tillman's Corner Faith family, that people have said, I'll tell you when I'm coming back to church, when the pews go back in. You know people have said that? All you chair people go, that's right, those pew people. i tell you what, those pew people. I'm a, that's why I'm a chair person. Do you know we've had chair people say, wait a second. You're taking my chair away? No, 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 you can't, you can't take my chair away. Here's what I know. I know this absolutely without any question. If you cannot worship God in a pew, you cannot worship him in a chair. And if you cannot worship him in a chair, you cannot worship him in a pew. <laughs> the posture of our worship matters, but it has nothing to do with whether we are sitting in a chair or a pew, or whether we're sitting on the floor, or whether we are standing up, we can worship God in any of those places. But there comes a time where we need to get on our knees before the Lord as a sign of submission to him. What was the content of their worship? They gave thanks. For what? For two things. For who he is. We praise you, God. We thank you, God. We give thanks to you, the Lord God Almighty. That is that Old Testament name that is not used anywhere else. Don't miss this. Anywhere else in the New Testament other than Revelation. It is what is translated most most of the time in the Old Testament as the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies, the one who leads the hosts of heaven. That's that phrase, the Lord God Almighty. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, for you are the one who is and who was, and then you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. So the content of their worship is they gave thanks for who he is and for what he has done. 
When the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of God, God's people will worship him, but that's not all. God's power will conquer the nations. I love the way this is worded in verse 18. Verse 18 says, the nations raged, but your wrath came. Those are the same words. It's just the verb and the noun form. But that verb form, even though it's the same word, has a connotation to it. It has the idea of pitching a fit, of a temper tantrum, of a little kid who doesn't get his way and just kind of throws a fit. The nations have raged. The nations have raged, but your wrath came. It has the connotation of control and a power and authority, and God's wrath simply is in, is in a controlled way poured out on the sins of mankind. The nations pitched a fit, but God just simply reigns and rules in perfect control. God never loses his temper, yet he pours out his wrath. It's a beautiful thought of the power and majesty of God, that he can't be rattled into losing his temper. Everything that he does is a careful and measured out meeting of his wrath against sin. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And so the nations do their thing as they've always done. Don't don't you feel like right now we are aware that the nations are raging? You know, we we are watching our news feed right now, and we're aware of two things. Apparently, COVID has been completely cured. It doesn't exist anymore, apparently. Can't find a story about it anywhere. But then this Ukraine thing, and my goodness, the people of Ukraine and how they're suffering and and the, the difficult things. It's not just Ukraine. If you were to see, it's all over the world. All over the world, people are suffering. But this particular thing has rattled us to the core. Let me tell you why it's rattled us to the core. It's rattled us to the core because we bought into the false idea that we could somehow, in the modern world, in the developed world, we could avoid things like this. That we had set up treaties and international agreements and just unwritten rules that one group wouldn't do this to another, one country wouldn't do it to another. We just kind of bought in that we're safe in that. And really, while we, while we, our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine, one of the reasons why we can't take our eyes off this situation in Ukraine is because we know if it can happen there, it can happen here. We're afraid of what might come from this. But the truth is, we've never really been secure because of peace treaties and because of agreements written or unwritten, because of unwritten rules. One sovereign nation wouldn't do this to another sovereign nation. We've never really had security there. Any security we found in that has been a false security. Why? Because nations rage. They pitch temper tantrums. And those temper tantrums are real and they hurt people and they lead to real consequences, but they are out of control. And God is in perfect control. And while the nations rage, God in his control says there is coming a time for the dead to be judged. The dead is Revelation's way of referring to those who don't know Christ. We don't know what Russia will get away with and what Russia won't get away with on this earth. But we do know that every leader of Russia who has anything to do with the atrocities that we are witnessing right now, all the way to Vladimir Putin himself, will be judged for what they do. They will stand before a holy God and they will have to give answer for everything they do, as will you and I. Anything that is not covered in the blood of Christ, we will give answer. An answer for. So he says, the time has come for the dead to be judged. And then for rewarding your servants. You think, my goodness, I'd love to be one of the prophets. Man, it says it right there. They're going to be rewarded. But notice by God's grace what he says. It's not just the prophets. It's the saints. And according to the New Testament, anybody in Christ is a saint. We've all been sanctified and set aside. But maybe your theology won't allow you to go there right now. So the Bible's going to make clear that we know that it includes all those who are in Christ because he says the prophets, the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great. You may feel like you're, you're nothing in the kingdom, but a time is coming when God will reward even those who are small in the kingdom, and he will destroy the destroyers of the earth. Although we ought to be very mindful of our Um, care for this earth and it's the people of God who are first and foremost assigned the care of God's earth and God's planet and we should take that very seriously. This is not a statement about environmentalism. This is not a statement as some have tried to use it to say well God's really going to judge those who are 
destroying the environment of the earth. It's absolutely a sin to destroy and misuse and abuse the environment that God has placed us in. However, what this is speaking of is those who have taken and perverted in every way the law of God and brought sin to the earth, and sin does its thing. Sin is a destructor, a destroyer. It just does what it does. Those who have destroyed the earth are those who have rebelled against the laws of God, and when you rebel against the laws of God, sin takes over, and it just does its destructive work. We know that well. We see it in our world. We see it in our own lives. So God's power will come and subdue the nations and conquer the nations. The wicked will be judged. The righteous will be rewarded. When the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of God, God's people will worship him. God's power will conquer the nations. And finally, when the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of God, God's presence will come to earth. Such a beautiful picture there. A little bit of a strange picture for us. The Bible says in Verse 19, that the temple in heaven was opened and the Ark of the Covenant was seen. That doesn't mean much to us, but it ought to. The, the temple of God, and, and literally there, it's the sanctuary of God. It's the Holy of Holies. It's opened, and now we can see the Ark of the Covenant. You go, that'd be really cool. You know, I'd love to see the Ark of the Covenant from a historical, archaeological standpoint and all that. That's not what it's talking about. The Ark of the Covenant is the very throne of God. When the people of Israel would go out for battle, they would carry the Ark of the Covenant with them because their king was leading them out to battle. They didn't have, until they rebelled against God and asked for an earthly king, they didn't have a king. God was their king. And so God would go out, and they would, God would sit on his throne. That's what the Ark of the Covenant is. It's his throne. And they would take God out to, to battle with them and God would go with them into battle. It's his throne. So now we see his throne. The ark is seen there and we see his throne and it's a reminder that heaven is coming to earth, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth and heaven is coming to earth and we will be with him for all of time. What Revelation chapter 11 hints at, Revelation chapter 21 makes clear. Verse 3 beginning There says this, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. There is coming a time where the presence of God will come and dwell on this earth with his people. It's coming. If you're one of his people, what a beautiful day that will be. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, there will be no more mourning, there will be no more death, no crying, no pain. The former things have passed away, but oh, if you set yourself up against him. See, there's a reminder here, yes, of God's presence coming to his people, but there's also a reminder of God's power, the thunder and the lightning. It's a reminder of what happened on Mount Sinai as the people couldn't even approach God because of his power and his glory there. And there's a reminder of judgment with an earthquake and hail coming to earth. You go, well, that's the judgment coming against those who set themselves up as God's enemies. So God's presence will come to earth. The Christian hope is that there is coming a day when the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of God and of Christ. We have been praying for that day, and we need to continue to pray for that day. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But that's not all we're called to do. There's actually a lot that we're to do between this day and that day. And and by the way, Pastor, when is that day? I I got a Facebook video the other day, and a guy had some charts. He was drawing on a whiteboard. Seemed pretty convincing that I'm pretty sure Jesus is going to return, you know, when, whenever, whatever. Uh, I need to remind you of a book I have on my shelf, and you can come look at it if you'd like. I keep it as a reminder. It's titled, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. It was a bestseller in 86, 87, and 88, but boy, sales dropped off in 1989. For some reason, nobody wanted it anymore. And you say, but yeah, but that guy I saw on Facebook with that video and those charts and drawing on a whiteboard, man, he had, he was using tons of scripture. Man, you can't turn a page in 88 Reasons Jesus Will Return in 1988 without seeing tons of scripture. There's plenty of scripture there. When will that day be? Let me tell you when that day will be. That is none of our business. It is God's job to look to Jesus and say, okay, son, go. That's God's job. But see, our problem is we want to do God's job and we don't want to do our job. See, God's job is to worry about when that day is coming. Our job is to worry about what God's called us to do on this day. And you know what God's called us to do on this day? He's called us to do all the things on this day that will happen on that day. 
God has called his people to worship him, and we are to worship him on this day in anticipation of that day, and that is how we advance God's kingdom. God has called us to take the gospel to the nations and in doing so to subdue the nations. Now, we're not to take up arms against other nations. We're to take up our, our, our scripture against uh, those who don't know him and we're to preach the gospel and we're to watch dead hearts come to life and we're to see every nation on earth, every people group on earth, hear the gospel, repent and believe and in so doing, we are advancing the kingdom of God on this earth on this day in anticipation of that day. And we are to be on this day, his presence on the earth. There is coming a day when God's presence will fill this earth. Until that day, church, we are God's presence on earth. God has placed inside of us the Holy Spirit. And you remember what Paul said we were, right? We're, we're temples. So we are, in effect, that little piece of God's presence as we are waiting on that day when God's presence comes to earth we are to take his presence throughout this earth we're to be the hands and feet of Jesus we are to work until that day comes on this day in anticipation of that day and we're to let God worry about when that day will be we also must trust that that day is coming and that's when it gets really hard because we we look at a situation like Ukraine and we say, God, now would be a good time. It'd be a good time. Why don't you come? I mean, boy, wouldn't it be amazing if an army of angels just swooped in, an army of the redeemed just came in and stopped the Russian army dead in its tracks, saved all those Ukrainian believers who are over there just praying that God will do something. Wouldn't it be amazing to see God right now fix all of this? That's been the heart cry of every true follower of the one true God since time began. God, today would be a day to make it all right. If there's ever been a day, today would be a good day. And so trusting God from this day until that day, that that day will one day come, is one of the most difficult things. Because for some of you, Ukraine, COVID, none of that really matters to you right now because you are walking through it as a family. You're walking through it as an individual. You're walking through some battle that you can't beat and you know God could beat it. You know that if God just got involved, he could beat it and you don't know why he hasn't done that. You don't know why. Well, God, I know on that day, that day, that day, but this is this day. And Lord, I'm having trouble trusting you on this day. Well, what I'm telling you is you've got to hold on your faith, onto your faith from this day until that day, and you've got to trust that that day is coming. You know, last night as Jackson and I watched that Spider-Man movie, after the battle with the supervillain and Spider-Man, you know, beats him and all that, we knew there was more movie to come. Let me tell you without giving any spoilers how the movie goes. Things get really bad for Spider-Man, really, really bad. There's a battle at the end, and Spider-Man wins. You know, well, you just ruined it for me. No, that's the plot of every Spider-Man movie of the last 30 years. This is the plot of every superhero movie. The superhero, things get bad for the superhero. You think, well, I don't see how he's going to get out of this one. And then there's a battle at the end, and he wins. And here's the thing. Not once, not one time when I was sitting in that movie theater did I think, well, that's it for Spider-Man. I guess he's done for. He'll never survive this. I don't see any way he can get out of this. No, I knew the whole movie, the whole time I'm watching the movie, this is my thought. Huh, I wonder how they're going to get him out of this one. This is interesting. Because I, I know there's going to be a big battle in the end, and I know he's going to win. I wonder how they're going to make this happen. I wonder what twist and turn is coming if they're going to get him out of the hole they've dug him in and bring him to the victory. Because I know how movies work. That's just how they work. I know at the end, come on, somebody is with me by this time, I know at the end there's going to be a big battle, and I know at the end the hero's going to win. Do you know that's the same posture we ought to watch things like this with? Hey, it, it hurts, and it's real, and it's painful, and I'm not making light of it. But at the same time, we ought to sit back and go, huh, I wonder what the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is going to do with this, because I know he is going to take this, and he's going to make it into something good for me and something that points to his glory. I can't wait to see how he's going to do this because this is a big hole and he is a bigger God. I can't imagine how he, how in the world is God going to make something out of this? I don't know, but I know he will. And that's what I'm talking about, having the faith on this day to get us through to 
that day. We are living in a world where we know this. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of God and of Christ. There is not a battle you're facing that will not be subdued to God and to Jesus. We must hold on to that promise in faith that no matter how bad this day may be, that day is coming. Now it's time to get real and get personal. What does it look like for you on this day? Where's your heart on this day? You say, well, I, but how do we do this though? You know one way we do it? How can we be so sure that day is coming? One way we can be so sure of many, but one way, is that we can look back, because there's been other bad days other than this one. We can look back in our own lives and we can say, you know, there was that time, oh my, I didn't know how I was going to make it. And God brought me through. If he brought you through that, he'll bring you through this. There was that time where, where my loved one got sick and it looked like it was death for them and God healed them and they're still here. If God brought you through that, he'll bring you through this. Well, there was that time my loved one didn't make it. There was that time the person that I cared so much about, I thought God was going to deliver them. He did not. He did not heal them. It crushed me, and God brought me through it. He did not leave me. If he brought him, you through that day, he'll bring you through this day. Well, there was that time where I didn't know what I was going to eat. Here I am. There was that time where I was battling some sin that I knew I could not defeat, and God gave me victory over that sin. If he brought you through that, he'll bring you through this. How do we have the faith? Where do we find the faith? We find it in remembering who God has been and what he has already done for us and who God has been and what he's already done for his people. And in doing that, we realize that if he brought us through those times, he'll bring us through these times. And if he br brings us through this day, that day is coming. We put our faith there. So we're going to do things a little differently today. We're, we're going to have a song before we have our invitation. Now, I want to say this. This altar is open any time. If the Lord moves on your heart and you need to be saved right in the middle of the sermon, you just come down front and we'll take care of that. We don't open this invitation because it was open 2,000 years ago. It's been open ever since. If you need to be saved, you come at any time. But I'd really, really like for you to do is just think about what God has done in your life as we sing this song. We're getting ready to sing in a couple of minutes. And I want you to think about what God has done in your life. And as you think about that, I want you to ask the Lord to help you trust him that if he got you through all of that and if he's made a way when there seems to be no way and if we, when you didn't know you could make it, you made it and God saw you through, that God will see you through this and he'll see us all through until that day. In fact, I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes where you are and to begin to think. Think of what God has done in your life. Think of what God has already brought you through. When has he made a way when there seems to be no way? When has he brought you through what you didn't think you were going to make it through? And I want you right now just to begin to go ahead and worship him for it, thank him for it, thank him for what he's done, and ask him in that, in that moment, Lord, help me remember. Help me remember what it was like to be in the fire. Help me remember what it was like to feel the pressure. Help me remember what it was like to see you bring me through all of it. Lord, help me in this moment, to celebrate what you have done. And now what I'd like to ask you to do, I'm going to pray for us, and then I want to ask you just to celebrate with our faith family what God has done in our lives. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, thank you that you've seen us through so much that we know you'll see us through from this day until that day. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.